Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be at the Stephenson Cardiac Imaging Center. Uh, my name is Julio Garcia, and I want to uh, talk today about uh, advanced flow hemodynamic asthma of our bowel disease in our dilatation. Um, I want first to clarify uh, three different topics that we want to talk along. Uh, uh, this presentation. First, what is aortic disease, aortic valve disease. Second, what is aortic dilatation. And third, what is for, for the flow MRI, how we use it, how we process it, and what kind of uh, information we can get for it. Uh, this is a nice example and video of a healthy control with the uh, acquired before the flow MRI and the kind of visualization that we can obtain. Uh, so, uh, we're going to talk first about the aortic valve disease. So the aortic valve is located on the um, human heart, uh, which is a moving structure that is beating uh, 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 during all the life. Uh, the aortic valve is located in between uh, the eleventh valve of the tract and the sending aorta, as you can see here. Uh, we can uh, have two different kinds of aortic valves. You can have a normal tricuspid valve that is easy to identify by this Mercedes Benz kind symbol. And you can uh, have bicuspid valve, that is just a fusion of the valve right here, have just basically two levels. Uh, when we look to the uh, guidelines, um, uh, we can find the definition of aortic stenosis as the partial narrowing of the natural opening of the aortic valve. So the opening is reduced, and we have less area on which the uh, flow can pass. Um, we can define a severe aortic stenosis when the transvalvular peak velocity is superior to 4 meters per second, the mean pressure gradient is superior to 40 millimeters of mercury, and the aortic valve area is inferior to 1 centimeter square. Uh, these three different uh, parameters plus the spreading of symptoms is an indication class 1 for aortic valve replacement. Um, when that, that happens, what we basically need to do is to replace the valve that is a uh, uh, disease uh, with a pro prosthetic valve. Uh, which kind of prosthetic valve we can uh, use? We can use a tissular valve that is basically tissue from bobbing of course in nature. Uh, we can use mechanical valves, can be bilevelet, monolevelet, or uh, valve cage. We can use new technologies as transcatheter valves, or better known as TAVIs. Um, for the focus on this presentation, we're going to, uh, in particular, uh, talk about our valve area, uh, how we assess it with uh, MRI. Uh, for that, I want to explain a little bit better uh, how the aortic valve works. So this is an scheme of the aortic valve. You can see here the leaflets, and you can see here the natural opening of the valve, which is the anatomic valve area. Now, imagine that we have some particles that we release on the level of the elemental the tract. These particles will now pass through the valve, accelerate, and contract until they reach the vena contractor position. At this location, we can measure the maximum velocity crossing the valve. And the cross-sectional area of the vena contracta here corresponds to the effective orifice area of the valve. Uh, after that, the particles uh, reattach to the ascending aorta, and some particles will now circulate in the aortic sinuses. It is important to see the differences between the anatomic valve area and the effective orifice area. Uh, the anatomic valve area can be measured by current imaging using 2D or 3D planimetry with equal Doppler or CT, and is reflecting the information about the geometry and natural opening of the valve. In the other hand, we have the valve effectiveness area, which can be measured by uh, cardiac imaging and some concepts from fluid mechanics, in particular the continuity equation, and give us the information about the hemodynamic performance of the valve. So we're talking about two different informations that are assessing in different ways the performance of the valve. One is just giving us information about the natural opening of the valve, that is the anatomical area, and the second one about the performance, that is the effectiveness area. Uh, they are related uh, by a ratio uh, between them, between the effective area and the anatomical area, uh, in something that is known as the con contraction coefficient. 
in addition to that, uh, as I mentioned before, we can uh, have two different kind of valves. We have we can have a normal valve. We can have a bicuspid valve, uh, which can be uh, may cause by the fusion of two of the leaflets from the natural uh, tricuspid valve. Or it can be a true bilateral valve when you actually have just two leaflets in in the aortic valve. Um, the aortic valve uh, can be characterized as a precuspidation by the fusion of the two cusps. Uh, it is a disease that uh, affects one two percent of the population uh, uh, and have a high morbidity and mortality rate in the population. The complications that those patients can present they are pretty heterogeneous. You can have aortic valve dysfunction, aortic dilatation, aortic aneurysm of the section, and in worst case cases you can have aortic rupture uh, with each uh, life treating uh, disease and problem of the patient. Uh, here uh, for the, this study we're going to focus on the aortic dilatation. Uh, what is the aortic dilatation? Well, you have here a picture with two panels. In panel A, you can see a normal thoracic aorta with a typical candy cane shape. And in panel B, you have a, a thoracic aorta with this kind of balloon shape in the ascending portion. In fact, this balloon shape is the aortic dilatation. And what we basically measure in clinics is the maximum aortic diameter of this balloon. And this is the information that we use to evaluate how sick is the, is the patient. Uh, what are the causes uh, producing this kind of, of alterations? Well, some groups believe that it's a connective disorder, a tissue disorder, more related to the genetics of the patient. And um, some other groups believe that it's related to the uh, alteration of hemodynamics um, in the Jurassic aorta. Uh, personally, I believe that it's a combination of both, it's a part uh, coming from the genetics and another part coming from the hemodynamics. Um, uh, both of them, they are interacting and triggering different uh, sectors that are leading to this disease. Uh, but for the focus of this talk, we're going to um, talk about the uh, uh, hemodynamic part of the disease. Uh, so here uh, you have a really quick summary of the different imaging techniques that we have available to evaluate cardiac diseases. Uh, and in particular, we're going to focus on cardiac MR and the measurement of flow velocities. Uh, how we measure flow velocities in MR? Well, we basically need um, uh, to apply two different uh, uh, stimulations during the cardiac cycle. Um, and these two uh, different stimulations are going to be applied uh, applied to, uh, to measure velocities. We're basically acquiring a, applying a reference stimulation and a flow sensitive stimulation and a single component uh, of the flow, basically the major component of the flow. By applying these two different um, stimulations, we can create a magnitude image that is providing us information about the anatomical structure that we're imaging. And we also obtain the phase difference between the reference and the flow of decision. This phase reference, in fact, is giving us information about the velocities. But uh, as you can observe, they are great values. Uh, how we translate these great values to velocities? Well, it is actually a linear relationship between the um, velocity and the uh, uh, limits of velocity that we acquire uh, in the scanner. Uh, we, in doing the acquisition, we set a parameter that is now as velocity encoding. Uh, this velocity encoding is related to the levels of gray that we have on the image, and each level of gray corresponds to a specific velocity. Uh, so by applying a linear association between the level of gray and the velocity that we measure, we can obtain the information of the velocities crossing and the plane. Um, how we use this information? Well, at the beginning, uh, the main effort was focused to replicate the measurements that we obtained with Eco Doppler and apply it on MR. So uh, um, the first measurements that uh, were performed by evaluating the velocities in the ascending aorta and the level of the track in the same way that Eco Doppler, we measured the velocity scanning integrals and the uh, 
maximum velocities and velocity gradients crossing the valve. We calculate the stroke volume at the level globe of track and the velocity time integers in less than an hour to, to calculate the valve effect of this area by using the continuity equation. Uh, so the first study that we wanted to focus was to compare how good is to in echo Doppler versus MRI. Uh, what we uh, can observe on this small study is that uh, the echo Doppler and MR, in fact, they are performing in a pretty similar way. They are well correlated and have a good argument. However, when we look to the observed variability and study vari uh, interstudy variability by repeating the same scan uh, uh, in the same patient in two different, uh, uh, two different times, uh, we observed that the MRI was performing better than the echo Doppler uh, in both for observed variability and for uh, study variability. Um, in addition to that, I was thinking how we can better use this information to obtain something else that echo Doppler is not able to provide. Well, a uh, thing that we can do with uh, uh, this uh, sample two-dimensional measurement is the calculation of the kinematic opening of the valve by using a simplified uh, instantaneous version of the continuity equation that I given here. Uh, applying this equation along the cardiac cycle, and if in particular during systole, we can obtain this profile that reflects the kinematic opening on the valve. And we can we can calculate different parameters uh, such as our the opening slope, the, the valve opening time, and the closing slope of the uh, aortic valve. We applied this approach in a group of healthy controls patients with mild, moderate, severe aortic stenosis, and we divide the same patients by uh, valve phenotype, by tricuspid and by cuspid valves. And uh, what we can just uh, quickly observe is that the shape of the kinematic opening change depending the severity of the aortic stenosis and depending the valve phenotype that uh, have each one of the patients. In addition to that, the opening slope was uh, close, uh, has a good correlation with the brain inarticulate peptide, which is a biomarker of the low ventricular performance and also is a good predictor of the outcome of the patients. Uh, I was doing that study during my PhD and I was thinking how I can improve the asthma of the aortic valve and the severity of the aortic stenosis. Uh, well, one of the ways that I uh, found uh, to probably improve this, uh, this uh, asthma is using 40 full MRI. Uh, the difference are basically that instead of using a single plane, we're using a full volume by acquiring different planes or slides in the region of interest. Uh, the acquisition is acquired in the same way during the cardiac cycle. We are sampling uh, different time frames during the cardiac cycle, but this time instead of applying just a single reference and a single uh, component of velocity, we're measuring a reference and the three components of velocities in the space. So due to the fact that we're acquiring two more uh, 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 stimulations, the resolution that we have within the cardiac cycle is less than in 2D, but we have the advantage that we're getting the full information with the full, the full volume and, uh, and the velocities. Um, uh, in, the, in this cardiovascular structure. How we reduce the effects of motion? Well, we use a navigator, uh, uh, a respiratory navigator that allows us to identify the cycles where the movement is present uh, and, the, uh, and reject them and just accept the regions where the movement, the movement is minimal and they are good to, uh, to, to accept. Uh, so for the full MRI, allows for this full acquisition of information in a, uh, in a full volume within the human body. Uh, how we acquire? Well, it's not any different as the standard protocols that we use uh, on MRI. We need to prepare the patient, uh, locate the ECG leads, uh, uh, locate the a surface code, in this case a body code, uh, we can use some contrast agent to enhance the image quality if we want, or we can do the scan without uh, any contrast agent. Uh, we need to define the parameters for the, 
for the 40 full MRI acquisition, we need to define the three-dimensional volume of coverage, the temporal resolution, the spatial resolution, the flip angle. Uh, we need to define the limits of velocities that we want to, to acquire by setting the velocity and cutting. Uh, uh, we need to lead with cardiac motion or respiratory motion. For that, we can use prospective or retrospective ECG gating, uh, free breathing ideally, and gating by using a navigator below, so self-gating strategies. Uh, we also need to choose how the data going to be reconstructed. If we are using radial occultation sampling parallel or parallel matching, uh, how we want to save the images, we are using the standard icon format, so we are using raw data from the system. All these, um, these three uh, parts of the workflow for the acquisition takes between 8 and 20 minutes uh, uh, to be acquired. After that, we need to uh, pre-process information uh, coming from the 44 MRI and we need to do some corrections. Uh, we need to uh, correct for eddy currents, mass flow terms, velocity aliasing. Um, also we need to prepare the data for visualization and quantification. So we need to mass the noise, uh, calculate three-dimensional phase contrast and geography and crop up to a specific direction within the human body we want to. Uh, and finally, for the data analysis, we need to perform a quality control. Usually, if this is performed visually by uh, uh, identifying the regions of uh, velocity aliasing, noise, or aberrant streamlines uh, on the visualization. And the quantification uh, of, of the different parameters uh, needs to obey the conservation of mass and be logical between them. Uh, so we mainly want to have a three-dimensional visualization by the streamlines, time resolved by lines, velocity vectors and perform some flow codification in, in particular peak velocity, net flow, mean flow, periphery flow, and revolution fraction. Uh, this uh, uh, part takes between 30 minutes and 3 hours to be done. So if we consider all the parts from the preparation, pre-processing, and data analysis, we're talking about one hour to four hours of, um, of analysis, which can be kind of long. Um, However, the results are pretty great after we do all that. Uh, those are just, uh, there's an example for a healthy control with a, a resolution of 2 millimeters, a temporal resolution of 40 milliseconds, and a decision time between 5 and 15 minutes. Uh, here is an example of the uh, anatomy that we can observe uh, from the photoplamorite data and the different components of the velocities. Uh, uh, we have a long and um, uh, huge amount of data uh, with this acquisition, so the better way to uh, visualize the information is by using dedicated software for visualization and streamlines and outlines. They are really useful to do that, and here you can see an animation of particle traces along the cardiac cycle of this patient. Uh, some groups have uh, done uh, a lot of effort trying to standardize and symptomatize the analysis uh, of this kind of data. Those, uh, this is the workflow that we use at Western University. And basically what we do, uh, we initialize the three-dimensional face contrast angiogram to visualize the anatomy within the human body. Uh, we manually place analysis planes along different landmarks in the thoracic aorta and as is suggested by the guidelines. So we have here a plane in the, um, in the Arctic route on the mid ascending aorta, the peak arch, and the descending aorta. Once the planes are located, we run an automatic um, uh, quantification of flow and generation of uh, three-dimensional cut lines, um, and here is the result that we obtain. So we can obtain the quantification for each one of the planes for peak velocity, net flow, forward flow, retrograde flow, and recorded fraction, and the animation and representation of the pine lines in the, in the cardiac cycle. Once we have that, we can generate a screenshot or report that we can easily transfer to PAX and in addition with some animations of videos uh, that can be used for a better evaluation. Uh, so this process typically takes between three, 30 minutes and 3 hours to be done. Uh, however, we have the full information of the velocity field. Uh, flow quantification is not the only thing that we can do for that information. We can quantify vorticity, we can quantify viscous energy loss, we can quantify Walsh stress, turbulent kinetic energy, 
or fresh ingredients. Um, in particular, I have experience with vorticity, energy loss, and voltage stress. And uh, for uh, this uh, specific presentation, I'm going to introduce some uh, of the studies related to vorticity. Uh, but uh, what is vorticity? Well, vorticity is the uh, capacity of a fluid to rotate around a specific point in space. And it's defined in 2D uh, by this equation, uh, which basically is giving us information about the rotation of the fluid. Uh, why we are interested in the vorticity? Well, we're interested in the vorticity because it allows us to quantify the jet shield layer crossing the aortic valve. Here is an scheme of the aortic valve. You can observe here the leaflets. Here you can observe the structures corresponding to the jet shield layer. Probably we can use the information for these structures to better quantify the valve effector of this area and uh, and they, and, uh, by then, better quantify the severity of the stenosis. Uh, so we apply this method using 44 MRI uh, data. Here again, the skin of the valve. You can see here the leaflets, anatomic opening, the efficacious area, and the uh, reattachment of the fluid into the vena contractor. This is the section that we are trying to detect uh, with the gesture layer detection method for the calculation of the valve effector effectors area. So here you have an example for a uh, control, here an example for a patient with moderate, and another example for a patient with severe aortic stenosis. Uh, on this column you have the streamlines coming from the velocities. Here you have in red the detection of this three-dimensional structure corresponding to the UHM layer crossing the valve, and in white you have the automatic uh, uh, calculation of the valve effective of this area. Uh, we apply this method in uh, 40 patients with mild, moderate, and severe aortic stenosis and 10 controls, and we compare the method with the standard uh, continuity equation. What we observed is that uh, the new method was able to better differentiate the severity of the aortic stenosis uh, in the worst cases uh, in comparison with the standard method. And it was also pretty efficient even with other uh, uh, aortic dysfunction was present, such as aortic dilatation of even other diseases as aortic dilatation of the combination of them. Uh, however, it's not the only information that we can get from this three-dimensional structure detected by the gear shell layer. Um, we can use the information from this structure to calculate the transpalable air flow angle. Uh, some researchers think that uh, the angle of the, of the jet can be related to the dilatation of the ascending aorta. So we, that is the reason why we were interested to evaluate this specific parameter using this method. Uh, so for that, we used information and that were acquired from for the flow to generate an aortic segmentation of the thoracic aorta, as you can observe here in panel A. And from this uh, full volume uh, or the segmentation, we calculate a central line, a volumetric central line. Uh, you can observe it here, this is the center line. And uh, from that center line, we obtain a vector uh, going in the same direction, the center line, in the, uh, at the beginning of the tip of the leaflets of the, uh, of the valve. Um, this information is important because we're going to use it later for the calculation of the jet flow angle. In addition to that, the same segmentation that we actually have, we use it to mask the velocity information coming from the 40 flow. MRI acquisition. And we run that little, the algorithm to detect the gear shear layer. So we obtain the three-dimensional structure corresponding to the gear shear layer. We calculate the center of mass, and we use the center of mass to create a vector. Uh, we have actually the vector from the certain line and the vector coming from the center of mass. So we can use them to calculate the jet angle corresponding uh, to, the, uh, to the displacement of the flow. Uh, with that angle, uh, we evaluate different uh, patients. In fact, 40 patients with different degrees of aortic dilatation and combination of aortic dilatation and, uh, and different degrees of aortic stenosis. And what we observe is that the jet flow angle increase with the uh, uh, aortic dilatation gamere, and uh, it was even higher when this gamere was related with some uh, degree of aortic stenosis. Uh, 
so we kind of confirmed what uh, some uh, researchers were thinking about the effect or the flow eccentricity and the flow angle and the association, and the association with our denotation. Um, however, what we can observe in most of the patients that have uh, eccentric flow and uh, a severe uh, dilatation of the asinine aorta is that the flow is a, it have a complex nature. Um, and typically, we try to evaluate this complex, na complex nature just visually, as you can observe here. The part line, the part lines indicating the presence of helical flow is just a visually, and a typical we just create this kind of helicity by look, visually looking to the animations of the part lines or streamlines of particle faces, and we can use the typical approach that we have with 2D planes because they are not enough good to evaluate the, this complex flows that are present in the ascending aorta. Uh, what we think is that this uh, complexity may be related to the aortic size and shape of the thoracic aorta, and they are maybe related to the allusion present in the aortic valve, can be a VIV valve or bicuspid valve, it can be a process of stenosis or rehabilitation, and it, it also depends on the magnitude of the flow. You have a higher flow, that you have lower flow that can change the hemodynamic patterns in the thoracic aorta. Uh, so to better improve this, uh, we explore a parameter that is known as local normalized helicity. Uh, for calculating the local normalized helicity, we basically need the velocity field and the vorticity field uh, to identify the regions where the flow has a left-handed rotation in blue here in the animations and regions where uh, the flow have a right-handed rotation here in red in both animations. The animations, in fact, correspond to a health control and a patient with bicuspid dilatation. Now, what you can observe is that the structures corresponding to the helicity, they are different during diastole and systole and differ between the control and the patient. Uh, so we don't want, we didn't want to just to visualize the structures. We wanted to quantify them. By this way, we we're improving the measurement of uh, uh, characterizing the presence of flow helicity. So this parameter we can, can be used for that. Um, to better understand and explore uh, this parameter, we decided to perform an experiment including 65 uh, controls and 50 subjects with bicuspid valve and some degree of power dilatation. Um, we use the segmentation of the full aorta to evaluate this specific parameter. And we, what we observe is that along the cardiac cycle uh, uh, from peak systole to mid, uh, systole deceleration and mid diastole, we found significant differences between both groups, controls and bicuspids and the flow was mainly uh, dominated by right-handed rotation. Uh, however, this is looking the full thoracic aorta. If we divide the full thoracic aorta in the three different segments corresponding to the ascending aorta, the aortic edge, and the ascending aorta, we can identify um, uh, different behaviors. And the ascending aorta, we, can, we still observe the significant differences between the controls and bicuspid subjects at each one of the different points that we evaluate during the cardiac cycle, a big system, acceleration, and mid diastole, and the flow is still was right-handed. Uh, however, when we look to the aortic arch, uh, we only identify a significant difference at big system and system deceleration between controls and IV, but no significant difference was uh, identified or, or observed during mid diastole, and the flow was still majority right-handed, but some changes were uh, would say a tendency going to the left hand rotation. And this was uh, um, even uh, completely different in the descending aorta portion where we didn't find any significant difference between groups. And the flow now was uh, left handed. So we don't have any, any more of this right handed flow. We have a dominant left handed rotation of the, of the fluid. Uh, so this is new information characterizing the uh, flow behavior of the uh, of the elicity 
in the thoracic aorta and it is something that is not able to measure with other techniques just with photofluoromai. Um, with that in mind, I want to go back uh, quickly to the previous workflow that I presented to you on how we analyze for the fluoromai data. Uh, this is the uh, standardized approach and symptomatic approach that we propose in our researchers. Uh, when we look at this, we also uh, think, what about reducing the time to initialize the three-dimensional visualization of cardiac structures by using the three-dimensional aggregate? If we reduce that time, and if we reduce the time that we spend locating manually the analysis planes along the thoracic tower, I would put more effort to automatize those sections, including also the flow quantification and animations, we can probably reduce the analysis time in an automatic way. So the first step that we uh, did to improve that was to develop an automatization of 40 flow MRI uh, uh, analysis. Um, we basically use cases where we have a pre-segmented uh, thoracic aorta coming from the 44 MRI three-dimensional phase control sign you get. We have the, the segmentation here, and we use the segmentation to generate a volumetric center line. And along the center line, we identify uh, specific landmarks as it is suggested in the guidelines. Uh, the center line that we calculate from the three-dimensional uh, segmentation was used to automatically locate analyzes planes along the thoracic aorta and, and performs some automatic measurements. On this case, aortic diameter, peak velocity, and normalized flow displacement. Uh, for that, we wanted to evaluate um, uh, how good this workflow was doing by uh, performing a study, including 65 controls, 50 patients with tricuspid valve and some degree of aortic dilatation, and 50 patients with a tricuspid valve and some degree of aortic dilatation. Um, the results that we obtained was that for the aortic diameter, uh, we identified significant differences between controls and bicuspid valves uh, in the ascending portion of the thoracic aorta as well as from control centric cuspid valves. However, no significant difference was present when comparing by cuspid valves and cuspid valve patients in the semi, uh, in the semi aorta. Uh, however, when we look to the peak velocity, we found significant differences uh, between the two groups in the portion of uh, com, com, uh, in the portion of between the ventricular upper tract and the semicular junction. So it's the sinus region where we identify the maximum peak velocities. It's important to notice that the maximum velocity is not located in the same location where the maximum diameter is, is presented, that is the mid portion of the ascending aorta. Uh, in addition to that, we calculate normalized flow displacement. We were interested on this parameter because uh, some groups suggest that this flow displacement can be related uh, to the degree of, uh, of severity of aortic dilatation. Uh, what we found is that it was a significant difference between controls and DAVs and co between controls and tricuspid valves, but no significant difference between bicuspid valves and tricuspid valves in the ascending aorta portion. Uh, so this, uh, this for this specific group, we didn't have found uh, any significant difference, and probably the reason is because both groups have a similar aortic diameter. Probably this flow displacement uh, can be can differ in different severities uh, of, of aortic dilatation, but that kind of results they are not present here on this study. Um, in addition to that, uh, we were thinking, okay, we were able to quickly automatize the analysis uh, along the thoracic aorta. Why not apply the same approach, both thinking on large databases? The uh, database where you have a lot of information on different groups and you want to evaluate them on a quick manner. So we developed this uh, workflow to perform a database automati automatization analysis, and it was completely implemented on my lab. So it is not in the necessity of any special software uh, for the visualization or quantification. But what we basically need is to get the path uh, corresponding to each patient that we want to evaluate. On each path, we need to have 
uh, the information from the velocity field and the information from the aortic segmentation. Uh, we uh, use uh, these two information to mask the velocity flow to the uh, region of interest, in this case the thoracic aorta, and generate velocity maximum velocity projections that are going to help us to better understand the flow and dynamics, and generate also some movies or animations uh, to understand the flow behavior. Uh, in addition to that, we use the aortic segmentation to calculate a volumetric center line in the same way that I presented before and identify where is located the maximal diameter. Uh, on the same location where we find the maximal diameter, we can calculate uh, the basic flow parameters that we uh, use in clinics and save all the results to uh, uh, an analysis after. Uh, in addition to that, we can get information, uh, demographic information from the DICOM files, uh, that which include uh, uh, information that we put into the scanner when we receive the patient. Using this, uh, this approach, uh, we evaluate uh, the database that we have at Northwestern University uh, of patients with 44 MRI acquisition. And we include a total of 106 uh, controls, uh, 375 patients with bicuspid on some degree of aortic dilatation, 301 patients with tricuspid aortic valve and some degree of aortic dilatation for a total of 782 subjects that were evaluated in 52 hours of analysis. This was just a single click and you just run the algorithm um, and it took 52 hours to analyze all the cases. This means an average of four minutes per case to perform the full analysis. This, uh, there are some examples of the results that we obtained using this uh, automatic uh, approach. It is a control with the velocity MIPS in sagittal, coronal, and axial views. We measure an outer diameter of uh, 65 millimeters. The maximum velocity that we found is 1.6 meters per second. It is an example coming from the video that. Uh, corresponding to the flow vectors at big system, and those are the flow measurements that were required. So we have a net flow of 40 milliliters per cycle, a forward flow of 40 milliliters per cycle, a backward flow of zero, because you don't have no neurogravitation, and a rotational fraction of zero. Those are the results for a patient with, uh, from the bicuspid valve group. We have the same uh, velocity MIPS, uh, the velocity vectors and the quantification of flow. We have here another example coming from the third group that we evaluate the precursor valves, have all the velocity MIPS, the uh, velocity vectors, and the corresponding flow measurements. Um, remember that we have information for the three different groups that we decide to evaluate. So we can quickly perform uh, a statistical analysis of the database, in this case for demographics, for age, hey, weight, and gender, and we found significant differences between the groups. And which can, uh, we also run some quick uh, correlation analysis between the parameters that we uh, that we have, for example, here, and the correlation between H and aortic diameter, between H and peak velocity, between aortic diameter and peak velocity. And we found significant correlations for uh, every group or different uh, for the different tests that we run. Uh, in addition to that, this is not the only way that we have to uh, automatize the, uh, the evaluation of the velocities using 44 MRI. Uh, here is another way how we can uh, use that information. Remember that we have information in all the full volume of the cardiovascular structure that we are imagining, in this case the thoracic aorta. We have the segmentation of the thoracic aorta and on this time we decide to divide in four different sections as I described uh, previously corresponding to the uh, ventricular tract, to the cintura junction, the same aorta, the aortic aorta, and the descending aorta. On each one of these sections, we, uh, we basically run of, uh, of calculate the uh, velocity distribution histogram uh, within the for the ball for the volume and the velocity stump within that volume. By obtaining this histogram, we can obtain something that we call the hemodynamic fingerprint. This hemodynamic fingerprint is basically a quick snapshot of all the information that we have on each one 
for each one of the segments, the segments that we are evaluating. Uh, for example, here we have the information of the volume, information of the peak velocity, the incidence of velocity is higher to one meter per second, the mean, median and standard deviation for the velocities, and information about the shape of the distribution of velocities, which are given by the squiggles and the courtoises. So on this simple snapshot, we can summarize all the information and quickly compare different groups. Uh, so to evaluate this approach, we decided to perform a study including 65 controls, 50 patients with micro speed valve, and 50 patients with triple speed valve. Uh, I'm going to just show, just for the shape of time, the results of all the patients uh, that were classified with mild, as mild aortic dilatation, moderate aortic dilatation, severe aortic dilatation, and aortic dilatation for us, the presence of aortic stenosis, and the those are the results corresponding to the uh, four different segments. So we have here segment one, two, three, and four corresponding to the uh, Arctic sinus, ascending aorta, Arctic arch, and descending aorta. And just with these quick snapshots, you can identify uh, parameters that have a significant differences between groups. Here for segment one, here for segment two, you have uh, the different uh, the parameters with significant differences. And here for the uh, aortic arch, different parameters have that have significant difference, and also for the descending portion. So this uh, approach allows to uh, have uh, a differentiation between groups in a really quick way. So I hope that um, now this presentation uh, convinced you that 44 MRI is a useful and powerful tool for the asthma of aortic valve disease an hour to dilatation. Uh, in particular, it is a lot of work missing. We need to focus more on uh, uh, for improving the evaluation of aortic valve disease, in particular valve insufficiency, uh, the evaluation of aortic stenosis severity on their low flow, low gradient, and normal ejection fraction, and the asthma of aortic valve replacement, in particular for TAVIS, we have a lot of work to do to characterize the perivalvular leaks. Uh, that we can observe in this kind of, of valves. Um, we have also a lot to work on uh, mitral disease by eva better evaluating the valve insufficiency and the different surgical strategies that we use to repair the mitral valve, as like the use of mitral rings, the different method of, uh, techniques that we have in surgery to repair, also the different kind of valves that we use to uh, replace the mitral valve. In our articulation, we we have an option now to automatize the analysis, but we need to prove how we're doing the, the automatization and how we are segmenting the thoracic aorta. And more importantly, it is a need to perform to multi center studies and have national registries to better assess the aortic dilatation and better guide the surgeons uh, to repair this kind of, of uh, aortic disease. Uh, so with that, I want to thanks uh, again for the invitation coming here, and um, I'm open to questions.